Hi, it's Kathy Chenna with Tri-Cities Magazine, and we are here at the offices of Fountainhead Network. And my guest today is well-known city councillor Craig Hodge. We are going to talk about trash. We are going to talk about 911, uh, whether you are with the fire department, and we're also going to talk about something pretty serious, mental health. So can we talk trash last? Sure. Okay. Okay, okay great. So recently you were in Victoria. Yes. You were, uh, tell me a little bit about that and, and what are you advocating for? So it was just over this morning, a uh, great announcement. The provincial government is going to put $150 million into uh, e-com uh, services into uh, the 911 service. Okay. And one of the things that, uh, that we've been working on with, uh, with uh, the province and with e-com is to upgrade the system so that people will be able to uh, use uh, text to communicate. Uh, we found now that uh, phones are not only are, are become not the main uh, um, way that people communicate anymore. Mm, okay. And so uh, now that people will be able to uh, send in uh, calls to 911 using text, they'll be able to send pictures real time. If there's something happening on the street, they'll actually be able to send a picture of that to uh, to ECOM. But that requires an entire upgrade of the system. Right. And so uh, that money from the provincial government will allow that uh, that uh, upgrades to begin. Okay. That's good news for local governments, and uh, it's good news for people that uh, when they need to use 911 that they'll have options there. Yeah, it, that's really, really good because, you know, um, during this pandemic, it's been taking longer for ambulance service to, to get to, to, to people and, um, you know, more more um, employment is needed as well. And so hopefully the $150 million is not only for upgrading this, I'm sure it's a massive system, but it's going to help get, you know, more people in, in into e-com so they do have that manpower and capacity to be able to handle, you know, our community's needs, right? Yeah, and, and there's, there's still going to be a lot more work that's needed to be done. Mm -hmm. Certainly operational, we're going to need to get more dispatchers there. Yes. Uh, particularly around the ambulance service, we're, we're still seeing delays there. So we need for First responders, but uh, this is one of the tools that uh, we're going to give them to to work and something for the uh, for the community. But uh, you're absolutely right. There's still a lot of work to be done, and we have to figure out how we're going to pay for it. And right. One of the things that's being discussed is a charge on cell phones. That's one option mm -hmm. because we do have to put more money in the system operationally as well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I don't know. I think if I had to text something and they were going to charge me fifty cents or twenty five, and it's something that's urgent of an urgent matter, I, I think I would be okay with that. Yeah. You know, so I, I, I'm not opposed to to that because it's in an in an emergency sort of environment. Um, yeah, it wouldn't be on, uh, per call, but it would no. be just anybody who has a cell phone. Previously, right. it was on landlines. Right. But now, with fewer and fewer people having landlines, that's right. the Funding's drying up. So it's old news, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Okay, good to know. Now you sit in a lot of different committees. You chair various things. Can can you just you know? I don't want to be here till tomorrow, Craig. I know you do a lot of things. And um, can you tell us um, a, a couple of the ones that you're chairing right now? And um, why are they near and dear to you? And why do you want to make a difference in in these different platforms? So a number of the committees I'm involved in uh, all all. They all revolve around uh, community safety. So I'm uh, I'm the co-chair of the RCMP local government contract, the management committee. Okay. So uh, I represent local government uh, when we're dealing with all things RCMP. Okay. And uh, RCMP is a provider to uh, most municipalities in British Columbia. It's the service provider. There's a few independents, such uh -huh. as Vancouver here at Port Moody. Uh -huh. But uh, most municipalities use RCMP as their service provider. And uh, so uh, I'm involved with uh, over seen some of the costs and and representing local government uh, when it comes to uh, to uh, that service and what else um, and as well I've also been recently on the uh, British Columbia roundtable uh, the committee that's reviewing the police act there was a an all-party committee that made some recommendations uh, two years ago 11 recommendations to how to reform the police act and so uh, I represent local government uh, in those discussions and uh, local government is uh, the main uh, uh, funder for police services in the province okay. and, uh, in some cases in some municipalities the the cost of Policing can represent 25 to 40 percent of a municipal budget, so it's a it's a big ticket item, and we have to make sure that we provide good services and we provide uh, services in in a very efficient manner. Right, right. Let's pivot to mental health for a minute here. Now, um, you're you're a big advocate of you know mental health and how we are getting um, sort of messaging across not only to youth but to adults and everything else. So let let's speak to me a little bit about that. 
Sure. I don't know that there's a family in, in BC that hasn't been affected in some way by mental health, either directly or indirectly. And uh, even those who may not see a direct uh, uh, connection to it, we're all affected because there's some real problems uh, from us, from society. That uh, So we are dealing with, uh, with the impacts of, of mental health. Um, certainly, uh, we were... In Coquitlam, we had Riverview Hospital, uh, had 4,500 patients at one time. It was a main service provider mm -hmm. for mental health. Yes. Um, over the last uh, several decades, the, that service was phased out. And uh, quite frankly, I think we saw the, the negative side of that. Uh, um, people were not able to transition into uh, community care the way we had thought. Right. And a lot of them did not get the help that they needed mm -hmm. in, their, in their home communities. And they've ended up uh, homelessness. Uh, on the, on the streets with homelessness that's impacted uh, into the, some of the drug addiction issues that we're seeing where some are trying to uh, to self-medicate. Mm -hmm. And so it has been a real drain on uh, on our housing. It's been a drain on our public service, uh, policing, uh, protective services. And I, and I think that uh, we just have to find a, a better way to uh, to deal with uh, with mental health, particularly around the um, the aspects of policing. Um, we've been advocating for a, a, a CAR 67 program, which is a mental health nurse or somebody with a health mental health background professional responding with police. Right. And right now, police are the first ones in because who do you call when you when there's an issue and you mm -hmm. have somebody that's uh, having a mental health crisis? Mm -hmm. uh, that's uh, police are the ones that get the call. Mm -hmm. Interesting when we're just talking about uh, 911 service. I'd like to see the mental health uh, uh, service incorporated into 911. So currently, when you call, the operator will say police fire ambulance. I like them to say police fire ambulance mental health. I'd like to see an actual uh, designated stream for those mental health calls so that they can be sp transferred directly to, to health professionals that would then do the evaluation on what's the best response. And so I think those are some of the things that uh, we can do, and I hope that we'll see some of that done uh, through some of the, uh, the money that's being spent with this uh, provincial budget. Mm -hmm. Because if, if if we're always asking police to come, police to come, that's going to clog you know, those lines up. But if you have that fourth stream, as you say, then those calls can get redirected. Because sometimes... Uh, a person that's a little bit out of hand at home or you know you might think it's domestic or you might think it's this but maybe maybe down deep down it is a mental health problem that they're having in that moment and 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 police aren't equipped they they didn't go to school to 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 sort of handle those types of issues so i, I like this idea and car 67 is that what you called it the car, the car yeah. 67 program mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is uh, some communities are, are running this program uh we have not been able to establish one here primarily because uh, uh, F uh fraser health has, has not uh, put the funding into it. Uh, some communities have, have started them. They're very successful. Uh, Vancouver is looking at a major expansion. They're talking about uh, hiring 100 uh, health uh, care nurses to, to deal with the problem. But we've also just saw the report that they're looking at a budget increase, yeah. a tax increase, yeah. um, property taxes of over 10%. Mm -hmm. So I think that the most appropriate way to deal with mental health is through the health care system. It mm -hmm. should be funded the same way that health care is funded. And the people that call for help should be treated as patients. Right. And I think that that's, I think that's the, the fundamental change that needs to take place. Right, yeah, I, I agree with you. That That's very good. Um, let's talk about uh, not not one of the things I mentioned earlier, but what's going on in Coquillam? Talk about development for a little while, if that's okay. Yeah, so we uh, we just had a project that uh, came through a public hearing uh, last night on, uh, on uh, you know, that's, that's going to be a, a, a big one. Uh, it's right on the Coquitlam uh, Port uh, Port Moody Coquitlam Port Moody border. border. Port Nation Heights. Yes, yes. Uh, those of you who know the You just school. approved six towers, right? Uh, six, I think it was I think it's actually more than that. Oh, okay. It should be nine, but okay. it's part of a bigger project that's being because uh, the other side of the Port Moody boundary is uh, uh, our side is uh, being developed by Polygon, the other side is being done by the West Group. Uh, but it is it is a major uh, um, development that's going to take place there. Mm -hmm. uh, it's near a SkyTrain station. Yeah. Uh, the project that we approved is great. It's going to have uh, some uh, daycare in it. It's going to have uh, um, below market housing. It's going to have some uh, commercial element. Mm -hmm. So it's going to be a complete community there. Yes. And it's, it's going to be transformational in, in that neighborhood. Absolutely. 
Do you need Port Moody to say yes before this this sort of gets gets going? They they will look after their side, but you know it's it developing. It's it's hard in in the tri cities. Uh, you know everything flows across border, and so uh, I think what you want to do is you want to have a a good project that regardless of whether you live on the the east side of the project or the west side of it, that you're mm -hmm. going to benefit from, right, from right. there. And I mean, the, you know, the transportation uh, right now with the closest SkyTrain station is Sayoko Station. So yeah. they will... They will gravitate there, yes. To, yes. to get to the station. Yes. Someday we may have another station at Falcon. So there, there could be another station serving this community. Mm -hmm. But that's just one. Uh, we've got uh, five or six master plans underway right now. Mm -hmm. We have one on uh, 329 North Road, the old Best Western yes, yes, yes. developing. Yes. Uh, Coquitlam Center itself. Mm -hmm. is that is going to really be booming. That's going to be and, huge. And even the Coquitlam sort of corridor. I mean, there's a lot of development. Like, I think I hear it all the time. Coquitlam is the next Burnaby in some ways. Like, not in a bad way, but but they're, they're pro-development in Burnaby. Of course, it has to make sense. But anything around SkyTrain. You're, you're going to you're going to build up, right? You're right. And the yeah. SkyTrain was the catalyst. Part, yes, yes. But we've got a hundred thousand people moving to the Lower Mainland I know. every every year. Mm -hmm. So it's it's a big it's a big group that's uh, you know a large population that's that's coming here, and they they have to be housed. And we need more people here in terms of our, our workforce. So there's yes. jobs that are going unfilled. So we need to have workers uh, here. We need uh, nurses, healthcare professionals. So we need we need people to work in the service industry. Mm -hmm. The challenge is we have to find a place to to house them, and we want people to live in the community. If we want them to work here, they're going to have to be able to live here. Yes. So, um, in terms of the Lower Mainland, uh, we're the we're growing quickly right now because yes. SkyTrain came here seven, eight years ago. Right. We're going to start to see some other growth in areas along the Broadway connector and now between Surrey and Langley. So mm -hmm. those areas will start to grow in the next few years. But right now, we're seeing the impact of uh, the land changes that occurred around those SkyTrain mm -hmm. stations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's it's very exciting, very exciting uh, to be where you are and see what the future, the next few years of Port Moody, or I'm sorry, of, of Coquitlam, where I'm a Port Moody, and that's why that slipped. Uh, but I, came from, I grew up in Coquitlam, so yes. I've lived in Coquitlam all my life, and yeah. for me to be part of that change is incredible because I'm having a voice in how that how our city yes. is going to transform, yes. what it's going to look like in the future. Mm -hmm. I have three boys, they're now in their 20s, I'm hoping that they will be able to afford to live in Coquitlam and we'll, we'll stay here yeah but aside uh, uh, in addition to the growth we also have some amazing uh, uh, recreational opportunities because this growth will help to fund we've just opened the YMCA we've just reopened uh, Place Maillard uh, we're going to be planning a community center on Burke Mountain. Yes. That will be the single biggest recreation project that the, the city has done. Amazing. And so it's exciting that we're going to yeah, be very exciting. delivering yes. some of these services. Yeah, very exciting, very exciting. And, and I'm sure you've seen transformations. I mean, you've, you've lived here all your life. Like, I, I would love to one day just look at some archive photos. This is what it used to look like. This is where we are now, you know. Um, I promise we talk trash. Yep. You are all about a zero waste uh, initiative. So tell me a little bit about that. I'll, you're the expert. And uh, so go ahead. Yeah, so uh, one of the committees that I have served on on Metro Vancouver, I'm on the board of directors of Metro Vancouver, which is the, the regional district, uh, 23 uh, uh, municipalities, uh, part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so we oversee uh, water, uh, wastewater, uh, some regional parks, but we also look after managing the region's uh, trash. Mm -hmm. And so I've been vice chair of that committee for uh, the past eight years and recently now I've been appointed to chair the National Zero Waste Council of, okay. of Canada. Wow. And and so what's different with that is that locally we have been focusing on waste diversion, keeping it away from landfills. Uh, you know, we've been heavily promoting uh, recycling and just finding ways to, to keep material out of the landfill. Mm -hmm. At the national level, we try to look for ways to prevent the material from being created in the first place. So we look at design and packaging mm -hmm. and things like the, the right to repair. And so what we're trying to do is make sure that it doesn't end up in the trash or the recycle bin, because in some respects, even it landing in the blue box can be considered a failure. Right. So what we want to do is to make sure that uh, we create a circular economy where products that come to, uh, to the consumer have an after life use or they become part of a circular economy so they can be reused. And uh, so we were looking at things like uh, plastics, 
packaging. A big one that we're focused on right now is uh, food wastage and uh, trying to make sure that uh, we reduce the amount of food that's spoiled uh, in the process. Uh, it's, it's, I think it's about 30% of what's produced in Canada doesn't make it from the farm to people's mouths. So there's okay. waste in the, in, in the stream, there's waste in, mm. the, in the transportation, in stores, and there's a lot of waste in, in people's uh, kitchens. In fact, uh, that's true. I think the uh, last report that I saw on average about uh, four and a half meals are thrown out each uh, week. In, in people's homes. Mm. And so that's uh, that's not good for the landfill. It's certainly not good from society. We have people that are going hungry. So yes. we have to make sure that we uh, make better use of the, of the food that's, that's grown. So what would people do then? If it's four and a half meals are being wasted a week at home, should I just keep eating? Or like, what should we do, you know? There, there's some things that... <laughs> then we're going to go into obesity and diabetes problems. Well, I think what you, one of the things that we talk about is menu preparing. When you go to the uh -huh, store, yes. know what it is that you're going to be preparing this week. So you just, just don't start grabbing a whole lot of this and that off, mm -hmm. off the shelf. A lot of the big wastage is in, uh, in produce area. Mm -hmm. So you just purchase what you think that you're going to, to use. I mm -hmm. think that's one of the key ones. Also, another thing that we uh, talk about is best before is not expiry date. So a lot of people think that once you've hit the best before that you have to throw it out. And it's no, that's the time that you use it for soups and, and yes, things. Yes, and very good. plan menus that, yeah. uh, that can be uh, to, to use the leftovers. Yeah, more versatile menus. It, I think it's really good. I think that people do need to be educated on these kinds of things though. You know, like my husband worked in retail for so many years and he tells me this all the time. Oh, that's just like an, a, a, a guide. But it says February 23rd, the milk is spoiled. It's not. It's still good for a few more days, right? Because I have that mentality, oh, this is the date, can't have it anymore. Whereas he doesn't, but it is educating. And, you know, I, I love the um, the blue box uh, idea that you just said, like, you know, why is it even making it into the blue box? We have to really look at those kinds of things. So I think, wow, I mean, our future can be, you know, incredible in terms of the environment and global warming and all of these kinds of things that are that are coming up um what other what other things did you want to talk about and maybe have our viewers know about well some of the other things that i've been very involved in is certainly on the environmental side uh and also on on heritage uh, that's something that i've been really advocating for mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, you know the preservation of, of heritage buildings yes uh, I'm, I'm very passionate about preserving history whether it's uh, written history whether it's photographic history or some of the, the homes in Coquitlam, particularly uh, in the Maillardville area. But uh, what's interesting now is as our city ages, we're starting to see heritage homes in, in other parts of the city now. Mm -hmm. And some of the designs that were unique in the 60s mm -hmm. are now we look and sort of say, well, that's just not an old house. Maybe there's something there that we that we want to preserve. And so finding ways that we can work with developers to, to save uh, heritage homes has mm -hmm. been a, a passion of mine. Uh, I think the other thing that uh, we're also looking at that is uh, um, how do we make sure that we house people in, in Coquitlam and, uh, and looking at some of the other areas besides uh, just around the SkyTrain stations. Mm -hmm. I think we need to, to look at uh, carriage homes, uh, laneway housing, um, big homes when they're being knocked down, maybe we put up two smaller ones right. um, along the transit routes. Uh, you know, maybe we look to do more uh, townhouses, row housing. Um, what is clear that with the cost of housing today and the cost of land, that we're not going to be able to continue to build uh, large homes on large lots like we, we mm -hmm. used to. Mm -hmm. And uh, But you know that creates its own challenges as well, because as people uh, downsize into a smaller uh, uh, living quarters, they don't have the backyards that they used to have. Uh, I mean, I was fortunate growing up in Coquitlam, you know, I had uh, you know, a swing set in the backyard, above ground swimming pool. We don't have that now. No, we don't. And so families that are going to live in, in apartments and townhouses, mm -hmm. their backyard is our, is our, uh, our parks. And so we have to make sure that we continue to provide a lot of amenities in our parks. So mm -hmm. that, uh, it, mm -hmm. it becomes shared space. Yeah, I feel like you have your fingers in a lot of pies. And I want to I want to say one thing, though, that has nothing to do with anything that we've talked about, because I read about this and, and you're going to correct me and finish my story before we uh, we conclude. But were you one of the or were you the only 
one, because I know you love history, and so the heritage part doesn't surprise me, but let's go to the p &E for okay. one quick minute. Okay. So tell me your quick story about that, and then we will we will say goodbye to the viewers. But were you the first photographer that photographed there how many years ago? I was the first contract photographer. That okay. Had. So I started yeah. in 1980. So I've spent uh, 45 years uh, at the at the P and E. Yeah. Uh, photographing. And you're only 46. Yeah. yeah I know. I, I did. I was in high school when I started. In fact, you I were. Okay. I started okay. My newspaper. Because I know that they printed about this, and I'm like, oh, that's so awesome. And there was yeah. a black and white photo, and then where it is today, and like the the picture of what what it looked like, and and what it looks like now, and I, I just I love seeing before and afters. It's, it's one of my, it's one of my favorite contracts is the P. Yeah, I know. So I'm lucky now that council takes its break in August. So I pick oh, up the camera and I have that's so awesome. That. My my kids uh, grew up there. They were in many of the photos that we used. That's yeah. where I met Darla, my wife, yeah. I met her at the at the P and E. Amazing. She was, uh, she was a chaperone for her sister. Was Miss P and E in 1985. So uh, so the P and E and uh, our family have a long relationship, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I really enjoy that opportunity to pick up the camera again and uh, and take pictures there. Yeah. You have to um, bring out your creative side, right? It's right. Nice, it's nice to have a variety in life, and that's I enjoy that. Yeah, fantastic. That and a little bit of travel. <laughs> <laughs> um, we are listening to you are watching uh, Councillor Hodge talk to us about so many different things that are going on in Coquitlam, but also uh, beyond Coquitlam as he sits on some provincial and national boards. And uh, if you want to find out more about what's happening in your backyard and more so in Coquitlam, check them out at uh, www.coquitlam. City of Coquitlam.ca? Right, City of Coquitlam.ca. I'm Kathy Chenna. Thanks so much for watching. Until next time.